Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. We're going to talk about stronger marriages. We have arrived to some, some new scripture that's a little different than the usual topic. Paul has been talking about our, our relationship with God and what God's done for us. He's talked about our relationship in the church and then our relationship with the world and how we should live in the world. We've been talking about that for the past few weeks. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Paul turns the attention to last week we learned about being filled with the Holy Spirit and that that scripture continues into being spirit-filled, having spirit-filled relationships in our home, having a spirit-filled relationship in marriage and with our kids. And uh, we're going to talk about the marriage today. Uh, for you that are single, it's all good. You can learn right now today who you should look for. Right? Like, let's, let's figure out what kind of spouse I should be looking for. And, um, and th I think it would help you very much to know that, to know what the scripture says and how we should live together in a marriage. And for us who have been married, let this be just more nurturing and strength for your marriage to make it stronger. You know, one thing I learned is that marriage is meant to glorify God. And so I want my marriage to point people to the love of God and to, uh, to help other people see what a marriage should look like. But I w really want people to see God and how he loves us. And uh, I, I gotta say that personally, I'm a little biased uh, and I have, I read into the scripture and I try to read it as it is, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to infer anything in on the scripture. Uh, we need to take out what it means. But I have to say that I, I have seen this lived out, this scripture lived out in my own home. Um, my mom and dad were such an amazing example of how to love and serve and, and be committed and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so I just want to, um, by the way, they're here today. How, how, yeah, go ahead. Let's <laughs> praise God. Thank you. How many years you've been married? I should know this, but how many years? 50 and a half. 50 and a half. Hey, way to go, dad, for knowing that. <laughs> way to, 50 and a half years married. So I grew up in a home and I saw my mom and dad love each other in such a beautiful way. And so I, I, I was fortunate to have that. I know not everyone has that upbringing. And so I pray that this message will help you, even some of the things I'll share from our own example. I pray it helps. And I want to say this as well. Uh, a great deal of misinterpretations and even blatant abuse of this text has taken place. Amen. There has been way too much uh, of people wielding this and having an unbiblical and demeaning authority over women because of this text. And so it's important that I squash that and immediately I'll do that up front because the first verse actually does squash the misinterpreting of this scripture. And, and you will see what I mean because there's some strong words in here and they're often taken wrong uh, because no one adds verse 21 in. Paul is going from spirit filled, be spirit filled, and he carries it into have a spirit filled marriage. Your marriage should be the way Christ wants it, not the way this world wants it. Not the way the husband wants it, not the way the wife wants it, the way God wants it. And that is key, that we filter our marriage through that lens. And verse 21 too often is separated from the rest, and it shouldn't be. In fact, in the Greek, you're supposed to read this without taking a break again, just like chapter 1. You need to read it through, so we're going to do that. And a lot of people will extrapolate just verses uh, 22 through 24 about the wife submitting and then never get to the, uh, the husband part. They, they kind of read that and go, all right, this is good. Good for me, right? No, you need to read on, husbands, because it gets hard for us husbands too. And so let's read it together. Verse 21, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that look like for wives? He says, for wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, 
This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Notice the weaving of the marriage of the church in Jesus Christ throughout this entire text. We can't ignore that part, and that's for a whole other sermon series, but what you need to understand when you read this scripture is that we know how to love one another because we know love the, the love of Christ for the church. And so it's important we take that from there. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies, for a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, he recaps, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I made this joke in the first service. I'll say it again. Uh, any emails, you can direct them to creator at godmail.com. <laughs> you can email God, let him know. Verse 21, I'm just the messenger, husbands, just so you know today. And wives, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Ver and I did, I did my best to fully understand this once again, coming revisiting again after years of looking at it. I revisited it again. And wow, what an interesting scripture. And especially when you try to look at it through the lens of today's time. We're going to look at it through the lens of that time and make sure we interpret it properly. Submission in the context of a Christian relationship includes the idea of putting someone else uh, and their needs above our own. And Paul begins this scripture by saying, do that out of reverence for Christ. So what he does is he says, we should do that for one another in the body of Christ. And then he gets specific in how we should submit to one another in marriage. And you may be surprised by this, husbands, but we're called to submit to our wives. And I'll help you understand what that means, how, how we actually know that. Philippians 2, this is in the context of scripture. Philippians 2, 1 through 8 this is the attitude that Christ had, okay? And so we, as people of God, husbands or wives, even children, anyone, this is for everyone, have the humility or the attitude of Jesus Christ. It says this in verse one in Philippians two, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave or servant and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's the attitude of Submitting ourselves. Do you know that Jesus submitted himself to God to serve us? The king of the universe humbled and lowered himself to serve us. This is the same attitude we should have. And Paul is saying in the first verse, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We do it because of our obedience to Jesus Christ. This carries into the next few scriptures. This attitude, by the way, of this happening is something that would be completely uh, not common in that day. And, and by the way, another scripture reference is Matthew 25, 35 through 40, when, when Jesus was talking about, feed the least of these, you have served and fed me. So we are to serve those in, in other positions. Jesus would be the one who would serve the poor and the needy. And he was king. Shouldn't they serve him? No, he lowered himself. He humbled himself. And he became a servant. Uh, this is interesting. It would be common for women, children, and slaves to be told to submit, but to include men in the list would be unheard of in the Greco-Roman culture. 
to add men to the list, to say, serve and submit yourself to, to others would be unheard of at this time. Paul is being super radical here because he's talking to the church in Ephesus who grew, who were in the culture of the Greco-Roman world. And now they need instruction on how to be a proper husband in the church, in the church. No longer are you part of the world, now you are in Christ, and so you don't live like the husband in this world, you live like the husband or the wife in the church, in the kingdom of God. So he's having to make sure they understand this. The Full Life Commentary says this, the wife must submit or yield in love to the husband's responsibility of leadership in the family. The husband must submit to the needs of the wife in an attitude of love and self-giving. Children, you ready for this? Children must submit to the authority of the parents in obedience. And parents must submit to the needs of their children and bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Did you know that? Let me explain. When my daughter is young, guess who has to help her get food? Me. I have to serve my kids. If I don't, there'll be milk all over the counter. She's not ready yet to do it herself. The other day, we got up together at the same time. And she's like, Dad, can you get me some cereal? I'm like, no, you get it yourself. You're older now. And then I realized, oh, I can't do that. Because she, last time, she spilled the coffee everywhere. It is my job to teach my kids to start doing things on their own, right? But the reality is I am called to serve my kids. I don't think we've realized that sometimes. He's saying, submit yourself even to your children. Give your life to love and serve your kids. Why? Sign me up. I love my kids. Give and give your life, commit your life to serve your spouse. Sign me up. I love my wife. That's what he's saying here. Now, the following verses need to be read and understood with verse 21 in mind. So remember that, what we just read. And this is a cultural, this is a major paradigm shift. This is a major paradigm shift because women were elevated to a more dignified position in the church than in the world at that time. So women in the, in the church of God, in Christ, you were, as Galatians 3 says, you were equal with, your, with men. Neither slave nor free, right? You're together, you're all free in Christ. So this is an amazing paradigm shift and this is what happens next. Paul says, for wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is a savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Remember the email if you have any problems today, creator at godmail.com. First of all, this principle is being applied specifically in marriages. Those in dating relationships, social or employment contexts, or a woman with respect to another woman's husband are not included. In other words, this is something that a woman does with her husband. Okay, this is not a, a, something that's in the workplace. That's important to understand. Secondly, submission is based on being as to the Lord. In other words, submission is not based on the character or performance of the other individual. Instead, there is an unconditional treatment of the husband based on love for him and love for God. Wives are to show love to their husbands regardless of whether they feel the husband deserves it, though perhaps extremely difficult at times. God bless you, wives. But this is the biblical ideal. And husbands, the same thing goes for us. We serve our wives no matter how difficult it feels it can be at times. Lastly, and this is really important because of the abuse that's gone on in our society with this scripture, it should also be noted that this deals with marriage, not abuse. Anyone in an abusive relationship must seek personal safety as first priority. Nothing in Paul's teachings here or elsewhere in the Bible commands a woman to keep herself or her children physically available for spousal abuse. Physical abuse is not okay. Protect yourself. This, this scripture has been used improperly to, to push that, that, that terrible practice in life. It's not biblical. 
What does the word submit mean in this context? The hupotasso is the Greek word. It's a military term, meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. Now, that's the military version of it, but in a non-military use, the Greek is such as a marriage is a voluntary attitude of giving oneself, cooperating, assuming responsibility. You ready for this, wives? Carrying a burden. You do such an amazing job, by the way, helping husbands carry burdens. It's beautiful. To give yourself voluntarily, not involuntarily. That's what this means, because it's a non-military use. Paul uses the middle voice in Greek to emphasize the voluntary nature of wives' submission. In other words, it is not forced. The Greek word is hupotasso, and it denotes submission in the sense of voluntarily yielding in love. So you give yourself to love your husband voluntarily. It's not forced. So husbands, we can't force our wives to submit to us. It's not like that. That would be unbiblical. Paul doesn't even give an example of what submission looks like, actually, until the end where he says, respect your husband. Um, He doesn't give an example, but he does this. He points to the church, and he says about how the church submits to Christ, wives submit to your husband. Well, how does the church submit to Christ? You know what we do? We, We humble ourselves. We offer ourselves to God. We yield to his leadership. We follow his way. We serve, we love, we honor, and we respect God, don't we, as the church? So wives, that's your example, is that you, you give your life to God, will give your life to your husband to serve, to love, to honor, to respect. It's a humble, it's a humble life. Again, Philippians 2 is important. We keep that in mind. Uh, verse 21, submitting to one another humbly, having that humble submission to one another. What's interesting is Jesus doesn't force our loyalty. Jesus doesn't force humble service and love. Jesus attracts it through his humility, love, and service to us. That's so important to understand. Jesus isn't forcing me to submit to him, it's a choice to give my life to him. I do it because he is a good God. Let me not jump ahead, but that means something for us husbands, to be a good husband. Let me, let me not go ahead yet. Therefore, what is Paul saying, wives, when he says submit, to give your life voluntarily, cooperating, and to give yourself to him? He's saying calling wives to a voluntary attitude of humbly loving, serving, and respecting their husbands as if they're serving the Lord. We serve one another in marriage, my wife and I. We serve one another because we love God and serve him first. It's out of our love and obedience to Christ that I serve my wife and love her and she loves and serves me. It's always for the Lord first. And when I see my wife, I need to see Jesus and go, Jesus wants me to love her a certain way, the way he wants to. By the way, the Bible never says what the wives submit to, or it doesn't, it doesn't give an example, but it says you should submit to your husbands. Ready? What do you submit to? The love of Christ. The love of Jesus Christ. Let me get to that. Look what the the scripture says. Now it's time for us husbands. It's time for us husbands. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Have you read scripture recently to see how Jesus loved the church? It's powerful. Wives, he's calling you to submit to a love in your husband that is like Jesus. Husbands, that's a great responsibility. That is a great task and call. It says here that Jesus gave up his life for her, the church, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she would be holy and without fault. 
wow, Jesus gave his life for the church. Husbands, we are to give our lives for our wives. Give it up. Love and serve and, and do whatever you can to help her grow right here, to mature and be ready for God. It's amazing. Our scripture spends more time explaining how husbands ought to love their wives. Why? Because Paul's day that he's talking here is a husband had no obligation to serve or keep his wife first back at this time. This was a revolutionary paradigm shift. Once again, I'm saying it because what happened was in the Greco-Roman world, the church of Ephesus, a husband did not, outside of the Christian life, the worldly life, the husband did not serve their wives. The wives just did it all. Well, in the family of God, that changes. That's when the wives say amen. You know, <laughs> now nah, we're on the same team. Notice that Paul does not stress the husband's authority over his wife, but his love for her. That's interesting. The husband's headship or authority is not that of domineering man who makes all decisions and requires submission by his wife. Rather, Paul carefully safeguards the dignity and well-being of a wife by defining her husband's authority in terms of the power and the depth of his self-sacrificing love for her. Ooh, that is deep. And that's powerful. We should show our wives the power of God's love, the depth of his love, because that's what Jesus did for the church. Verse 25, Paul com confronts the, the husband with a difficult charge. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. The husband has a great task. He must love the way Jesus loves the church, which is of great sacrifice, which is of, of love and selfless servitude. The word love here again is agape love. It's that love that Christ showed where even if he wasn't loved, he loved. And husbands, men in the room, if you haven't had a model of this, if you haven't had a model in your home, let me encourage you to study the life of Jesus, to study the word. He will be your example on how you should love your wife. He won't steer you wrong. He will help you. Because I realize that not everyone was raised in a home with a loving father and a loving mother loving each other the biblical way. That's why Paul's taking time to give instruction. Here's how we should do this. Remember, we're talking about a Greco-Roman world where they did not treat their wives well. Paul had to spend extra time explaining to the husbands how you should treat your wife the way Jesus wants you to treat her. And so we as, as husbands have got to take the time to know that too. And our example is Jesus Christ. Singles, your example is Jesus Christ. S male or female, your example is Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to be served. And he didn't wait to be loved. Jesus initiated both. Husbands, we lead the way. It says that we're the head, right? So that means we lead the way with humility, with love, with respect, with every trait of Christ. We should lead the way. Serving and loving, take the initiative. Husbands, we lead well when we humbly take the initiative to love and serve our wives. Paul goes on to show you how vital this is because he brings up the one flesh scripture. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. 
Once again, we see here a scripture about this one flesh, but there's this care. There's this care that Jesus has for the church. And husbands, we are to have care for our wives to help her. I like what John Stott says. He says, the husband's headship of his wife is a liberating mix of care and responsibility rather than control and authority. This distinction is of far-reaching importance. It takes our vision of the husband's role away from questions of domination and decision-making into the sphere of service and nurture. Why would he say that? Why, why am I saying there's this care and there's this serving? Why are husbands called to serve? Well, it's because Jesus was a servant leader. That's in scripture. Jesus was a servant leader and taught servant leadership. He taught his disciples to not lord authority over others. That's what they do. We don't do that. We serve. The greatest in the kingdom of God are those who serve. Jesus demonstrated. Do you know what he did? He got down on his knees and he washed the disciples' feet. You can read it right here, John 13, 12 through 15. He even washed Judas' feet. That's the one that hurts. That's servant leadership. What we're reading here is a love that leads away by serving spouse, serving the wife. I'm called to serve my wife just as Christ loved and served the church. The scripture about being one is so key because we submit to one one another because we are united as one. We're going to affect each other in a positive way or a negative way based on how we treat each other. Because we're, it's a mystery how it works, but spiritually we are one in God's eyes. We are one. And so how I want to be treated, well, guess what? I should treat my wife that way first. And the way she wants to be treated, she would uh, treat me the same way. And when we hurt each other, we hurt both of us. When I don't deliver my side, I hurt us. I hurt me. I don't want to see my wife hurt. I don't want to see her struggle. I want her to be okay. I want her to be strong. I want her to be nurtured and cared for because we're one. And Jesus affirms this as well, how important it is that we see ourselves as one. And Paul just spent a ton of time explaining that in our scripture before this. So husbands, wives, look at yourself as one. Think about the need of the person sleeping next to you or across the table from you. You are one together in Christ's eyes. Love each other. Paul recaps everything with this one verse. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I like the amplified version. Helps us understand a little bit more of the respect aspect here. It says, however, each man among you without exception is to love his wife as his very own self, with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness. And the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and and treats him with loving concern and treasuring him, honoring him and holding him dear. It's beautiful. So how, how do we do this? And why? When we mutually submit to one another with love and respect, we both are fulfilled. Our marriage is stronger and our unity brings glory to God. Our unity is supposed to bring glory to God. We will have a stronger marriage. My wife and I, we work together. Again, I feel like marriage is really teamwork. And uh, we've been looking into solar panels for our house, just considering it. It was, I was thinking about getting them. Earlier in the, in the first service, people were like, like this. Yeah. Some might, agree, might disagree with that. Um, we've been researching it, and I bring my wife into that because we're married and we're one. It's not a decision I'm going to make by myself. This is a decision I'm going to make with my spouse, my wife. 
because she has dignity and respect in my eyes. She has discernment. She has value in God's eyes. She's important and her voice matters. You know what? She also shares a bank account with me. (laughs) We're one. Our marriage is one even in our bank account. Just so you know. We share our bank account because we're one. And for us, there's no plan B. The D word doesn't exist in our marriage. We don't want that. So we're gonna do everything we can to sacrifice ourselves and to serve and love each other because we're one. And we want, love doesn't separate. I wanna stay with my wife. So when it comes to solar panels, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get an argument over my wife for that because we're gonna agree together. We're going to research and figure it out and pray and seek counsel. We've been asking other people, you know, what should we do? And I, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. I probably should say I'm on the roof. <laughs> I'm on the roof about it. But when it comes time, we're going to make the decision together because we're one. So that's what I saw in my home. That's what I saw growing up with Pastor Kuhn and Angela. I saw them make decisions together and they prayed together and they respected each other. And if my mom said, you know what, husband, go for it. And it messed up, it's okay. It didn't work out, that's all right. My wife, she came to me and she said, I want to do a Bible study on Wednesday nights. You cool with that? I'm like, yeah, I'm cool with that. Of course, you didn't even have to ask me. But you know what, she respected me to ask because she knew that was gonna be a schedule, it's gonna be commitment to young girls. She, she teaches middle school girls in, in the Bible and has a small group at our house. And she respected the fact that that's gonna be some labor and some love and it can make her tired and it can be a sacrifice on Wednesday nights. And I'm already doing my group, so why not? And so she's doing it, but she respected me to come and ask, what do you think? And I was like, of course you should. That's mutual love and respect. And that's what I saw growing up. And I, and I realized that maybe that's not always the case all the time. So I wanted to share that story. What we see in this scripture is that Jesus should be in the middle of our marriage. When you read this scripture, Jesus and the church are constantly weaving in and out with Paul. You take Jesus out of the equation of your marriage, you're going to be in trouble. You keep Jesus in and you have the power of his love that holds you together. If his love doesn't separate us, if we're not separated from his love, according to Romans, then if his love is in our marriage, guess what's going to happen? We're going to stay together. He's weaving the love of Christ. And so we would, it would behoove of us to look at Christ and go, how should I love my spouse? And I want to tell you one of the advice, uh, the tips I give marriages is the love serve cycle. Love as you would want to be loved, serve as you would want to be served. Give and receive over and over again. I give my life. My wife gives her life to me. And guess what we both get? We both get something from it. Now, it's not about getting something from it. It's about giving. And when we both give, we both get. It works. The Bible works. What do you know? Love and serve one another. It's when one party or one side doesn't do their part in being like Christ in the marriage that things get off. The cycle breaks. Someone feels neglected. Bitterness rises up. Arguing starts happening. But if we both die to ourselves, and by the way, I read a commentary that says the the wife is to submit, but the husband is to die. I was like, wow, that's heavy. But then I I read the scripture again, and I look at Jesus on the cross, and he died for the church. He gave up his life. Husbands, we are to die to ourselves. We give up our own selfish desires to love and serve our wives. That's what Jesus did. When we give, we are both blessed. When we both love and serve one another. And submission, in that way, is not burdensome. Submission to Christ is not burdensome because Jesus shows great care and grace for the church. It's a joy to serve Jesus Christ. And so it should be a joy to serve one another and to love one another. And it will be when we both do it right. So husband, lead the way with grace and truth 
and strength. Give yourself to your wife. I was in a wedding, I was doing a wedding for a husband, and uh, you know, when you read this scripture, you don't understand it, it can, it can kind of make the husband feel like, yeah, 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 Smith, yeah, yeah. And then you get to the, the part about loving like Jesus, and you're like, oh, okay, oh, hey, hold on, pastor, don't read that part. But I told him something really, I think I found powerful but strong, and it, and it hit me. I was writing this, this message for his wedding, and I said this. It's really simple. Be someone worth submitting to. Be someone. Some of the wives are like, tsh, tsh, you know, elbow jabs. <laughs> no, it's not like that, but be someone worth submitting to. Isn't Jesus worth giving your life to? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Wife. Same thing. Be, be someone that, he, that a husband enjoys giving his life to, loving and serving. It's what we're called to do. It's what we're called to do, to give up our own interests and to think about the interests of our spouse. And I want to say one more thing in closing. And then we're going to take a moment to honor and give tribute to the men and women and families who have sacrificed their life for us in this country, which is a really fitting day because we give up our lives to love our spouses. But husbands, I have a little something that uh, I've noticed in counseling or mentoring discipleship. I have found husbands that our wives want us to lead. They want us to lead. They want us to take that great responsibility of being like Jesus and taking the initiative to love and serve them. Wives want you to lead and you can, you can do it because Christ teaches you how and he gives you the power to lead. And if you haven't had that example in your home, Jesus is your example the way he does it, the attitude in which he does it, his commitment, all those things. It's the way you can serve and love your wife. And you know what? We need to lead our kids to God. Men, husbands, we need to lead our kids to God. We need to lead them to church, lead them to the Bible at home in prayer together. We need to lead. If we don't, then the wife is gonna have to. And don't be bothered if she is because you chose not to. We need to lead the way. And wives, let your husband lead. Even if it doesn't, it's not the way you want it to be done. Release control. Yield in love. Submit to his authority. Submit to his role in your life. Submit to his place in the body of Christ and let him lead. Yield to him doing it. If he doesn't do it right, it's okay. Let him learn. Let him learn. And you know what else? My wife and I, we lead together. Because there's nowhere in scripture that says you can't. If I'm gone, does that mean my kids shouldn't have devotions because I'm at a meeting at nine o'clock here? No, my wife can lead devotions. There's nowhere in scripture that says she's not supposed to do that. So my wife can take the role and say, let's do this. Let's do this, kids. Let's pray, let's read the word together. We do it as a team. In fact, I love sometimes just listening to my wife do that. I think it's awesome. We do it together, because we're one. We're one. So husbands, your wives want you to lead. Lead the way. Lead the way. Follow Jesus as you lead. Isn't that cool? We have Jesus as our leader. And man, if we're the head and we're supposed to lead, then let's follow our leader, Jesus Christ. Let me pray. God, this is a powerful scripture to understand. And there's so much more to understand. So help us, God, as we read it, as we learn to apply it into our context today, we want to bring in what it meant then and bring it in today. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus as our example. 
We thank you, God, that we're called to mutually submit and commit our lives to one another. It may look a little different, but we're called to love each other, to humble ourselves and serve one another, to edify, encourage, build each other up, committed with our vows in, in sight of God, in the sight of you, God, committed to one another, vowing to love one another till death do us part. God, thank you for making us one. And so, God, may we treat each other as such and consider the thought and the respect of our spouse. Lord, help us to apply this. Lord, I pray for marriages today that need a healing. Jesus, heal today. God, I pray humility would be in the beginning and the forefront of those decisions made today to work on their marriage that they would humble themselves out of reverence for you and they would do what they're supposed to do out of reverence for you. God, I pray that you would help us as husbands to follow Jesus. As he leads us, we will lead the family. Lord, strengthen us. Thank you for your example. May we have stronger marriages because of today's message in this scripture. Thank you for being the strong, committed love for us. So we show that same love to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you.